Sebastian. Hi, Sebastian. Hi, John. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? Hello, everybody. I'm doing really good. Do you love the Kobold Press um, intro animation as much as I do? Uh, it's awesome. It's like a wraith being summoned up. It's like it's uh, we like we can kind of only hope to be that epic, right? It's like we're being conjured. Yeah, conjured. Very good. Let's conjure up a little discussion about homebrewing a 101. Oh, I would love to. Great. Oh, we should introduce ourselves. We should. Before we do that, shouldn't we? Why don't you go yeah. first? Oh, hi. I'm Sebastian Rombach. Uh, uh, I'm back again, and I'm here to discuss some homebrewing with you all. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Great. And I'm John Swatsky. I am a uh, diligent worker in the Kobold Warren, uh, working in their pixel and word mines. Um, I have a bunch of uh, work out on Kobold Press and have been privileged to uh, submit stuff for their collections and, and uh, group projects as well. Um, and I am super excited to be here with Sebastian to talk about homebrewing. All right. You want to get into it? Yeah, let's go. Let's bring up our first slide. Look at that. It's a great title page. Right? Hey, what is homebrewing? Oh, uh, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot yeah. uh, uh, throughout the entirety of D&D, I think. Uh, but really, uh, it comes down to like um, uh, uh, making your own D&D. Uh, hmm. outside of uh, outside of like third party content or official content uh, 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 it's about making it your own uh, dreaming up what uh, you have uh, 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 what you have cooking in your mind and you want to put it to words and you want to play with others uh, whether it's you know making content whole cloth uh, like magic systems which geez I feel like that's a joke thrown around uh, you're just like oh you play D and D well here uh, why don't you listen to me talk about my 13 page magic system yeah uh, uh, campaign settings adventures rules <laughs> anything you can think of and want to play with uh, I think counts as homebrewing yeah I would add for sure I, I really want to pick up on that idea that like homebrewing is sort of an opportunity for you to customize your game tables experience. Right. Um, yeah. And and to make the session and the campaign um, unique and sort of specific to your table and your players as well. Um, let's go to our next slide because there's a few more things. Homebrewing is a few more things. Right. Um, I think that homebrewing is connected to improvisation. When Sebastian and I sat 100%. down. To to talk about what homebrewing is. Sebastian had a really good sort of like broke it down like, okay, so there's published work um, where you sit and you spend a long time and you're like, okay, someone's going to like either pay me for this or they're going to publish it. And that requires a certain level of polish and a certain level of research. And in Kobold Press's case, it would be like play testing, that sort of thing. Um, and style uh, guide as well. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, but homebrewing um, sort of offers you this place to play where the stakes aren't as high as trying to deliver a published product. Um, and, and I also do think that it's, it's also pretty connected with improvising. So it doesn't like, let me get, let me, let me be frank. Like if you're the kind of player or the kind of GM that will sit down on a Sunday afternoon for an hour and like hammer out just the sickest monster for your session or, like you are my kind of person. Like I get it, I understand it. And like, you know, you're spending time like writing all the like mechanics out and stuff like that is super valid. Uh, but homebrewing can also just be like, holy crap, I need uh, an area effect for this encounter. And how do I go about uh, kind of coming up with that? Or what are the constraints there? I compared homebrewing, <laughs> I said homebrewing is making muffins for your friends. I love um, that. You're not going to sell them. And if they look like pudding golems, uh, <laughs> that's fine. I am not a great baker. I'm a good cook, but I'm not a great baker. However, my family still eats the, the, the buns that I make, even though they look like potatoes. And it doesn't really matter, right? Um, and so there's a kind of spirit there, like, you know, not, not to sweat that too much. 
But homebrewing is also a chance for you to play with your understanding of the mechanics of the game a little bit. Um, and to, I think the homebrewing can offer you sort of like a, a an anvil to hammer out your, not only your ideas, but also your understanding of those mechanics and the, that, that aspect of it. Um, yeah. So anything to add to that, Sebastian? Uh, well, yeah, uh, actually, uh, I want to touch on that, your understanding of mechanics. You know, we're in our first, fifth edition of d and right. and there is, even though what we have now is is distilled in such a way, it's not the only thing to be played, and mm. there, you can draw upon our legacy of, of game mechanics and uh, D&D resources uh, to play with and uh, experiment with and and bring to uh to fifth edition or whatever edition you you uh, play with and uh, uh you can mold and and, pl- and screw around with that uh, yeah. same with like other rpgs uh, i mean uh it, you, it's all converse to each other yeah how often do you bring in systems or whole bits of mechanics from other gaming systems into, say, your D and D sessions and campaigns. Like, do you do that often? I do. From yeah. Other editions or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I I got started on second edition, but right. the most of what I played is actually three point five. Right. Uh, and uh, I really like to uh, refer back to those books and find stuff that was memorable for me that really excited me as a kid, and uh, uh, reintroduce that to to my current players who. Uh, some of them are uh, have have been playing with me for a long time, and a few of them haven't. So it gives me a chance to kind of like reintroduce that. Um, I believe yeah. Matt Colhill uh, did a really great uh, video about um, uh, the value of fourth edition mechanics and how you can apply that to designing a monster. Uh, that sticks out to me, and uh, I refer back to that every once in a while as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Do you think that we've covered what homebrewing can be? Should we move on? Yeah. Okay. Let's go to our next slide then, please. Oh, okay. This is super exciting. So when Sebastian and I were having our conversation, um, it suggested that homebrewing was like a collaborative process. And for some reason in my brain, this was like, of course it is, but it was a new idea to me. Um, So please elaborate a little bit on what is meant by homebrewing as collaboration. Yeah. Well, you don't, I mean, you can, but you don't usually play D and D alone. You play right. it with other people. Right. You enjoy the content with other people. Why wouldn't you uh, branch that out a little bit and brainstorm with other people? Uh, uh, a few months ago, um, we were playing a game, and the players wanted to do something that was essentially a, a higher level spell effect, but also required a lot of time. It took like an entire day to cast. And we didn't really want to play through that. We didn't really have the game time for us to play that out. Hmm. So instead, we spent maybe like a 20 minutes, half hour, spitballing a new spell. Because uh, there was like two clerics in the group and a warlock and um, a very um, uh, creative uh, rogue. And we took the time uh, and figured out how to uh, devise a spell that kind of replicated the same effect, uh, uh, played out in a narrative way. Uh, in the game uh, and uh, put it all together and then played with that. Uh, that turned out to be a lot of fun. And it was yeah. so much more fun doing that together than yeah. it would have been me on my own uh, trying to make that make that work and then presenting that to them and for them to experience it for the first time. Uh, the opportunity to play together, I think, is is the real value there. Yeah. And that so that happened like live in session. Like that yes. was a session based thing. It was like, okay, let's make a spell. Yeah. And that was part of the session. That's brilliant. I love that. That is really fun. That, it is. That is a super fun way of doing it. And uh, especially if you like have a group of folks that you trust and you've kind of like established all of the boundaries and the, you know, had your session zero and everything like you're, you're, that's a very cool thing to do. I love it. I think one of the added values uh, there, or one of the uh, hidden values, I should say, is that everyone has a different point of view. Uh, uh, you may have heard the phrase, where do you keep your catch up? Is the idea that, um, uh, no, never, keep... I've never heard. No, that. you, you that haven't. Nope. Okay. Nope. Okay. Nope. okay. All right. So the I phrase, where do you keep your catch up is yeah. a reference to, uh, uh, 
people thinking differently, uh, keeping their things in different places, whether it's oh, the cupboard, okay, the fridge, it. on the counter, on cool. the table. Uh, yeah. You're looking at you're looking at the same thing differently, and uh, uh, in gameplay, that's super valuable. Uh, you can uh, play with something and see see what you're trying to come up with in a different light that uh, may be better than the way you're coming up with on your own. Do you have like as the GM if you're collaborating a homebrew thing? Do you give yourself the power, like the final say, as the as the as the arbiter of the rules? Like, if you go through and look at like what is the DM's role, like, or or how did you how do you deal with like that sort of process, like that, like a I, spell, for example? Yeah, you could do that. Uh, that's certainly one way you could go about it. Um, uh, for me, I I try not to present myself as uh as a decision maker to my players rather i'm just the arbiter i just try to stay consistent with uh with what um rules we do have right. whether that's uh house rules which is definitely a type of homebrew uh uh to uh actual game mechanics i just tried to try to stay consistent with uh with the written word and uh also my past uh, uh arbitrations uh and also try to do it in a way that's both fair and fun. Yeah. Great. Very cool. Should we move on? Sure. All right. Let's go to our oh, next. Uh, actually, oh, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, reference there to the danger room. Uh, when you come up with something, uh, play around with it a little bit. As part of uh, the collaboration process, uh, you can play with your characters, maybe a way that's not necessarily inside the narrative that you're running with. Uh, that you can test out the things that you're doing, uh, uh, kind of like the X-Men's Danger Room. Uh, just see kind of how it works and how it feels uh, in gameplay without like the stakes of, 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 of an actual narrative. That's a really fun example, actually, that your homebrewed content are elements of the Danger Room at, at the Academy for the X-Men. That's a really good way of putting that. It's like, wow, we really overtuned that, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I I also borrowed that from Matt Colville. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, uh, homebrewing uh, for players. Yeah. Uh, there's, you got races, backgrounds, subclasses, items, spells, everything that a player would use and enjoy in a game uh, uh, pertains to them. And when you're homebrewing uh, together uh, collaboratively, uh, you it's a good idea to include them in on that. Uh, uh, buy them into your to your idea and to your concept. Uh, uh, work at uh, work at looking at current uh, content uh, to compare against, uh, and uh, see what what you can come up with to uh, uh, create your concept. So, when you're creating sort of player options like this. Like it, this is a homebrewing 101. So like if I were to, if I had just started playing and I kind of want to get creative, I'm familiar with the rules, but not super comfortable with improvising. Is there an element that you would start with? Like, was there a, is there a thing that's like a little bit less complicated to start oh, with? Oh yeah. Did you understand uh, what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think the easiest, I think you're, you're, most straightforward in is crafting like a spell or mm. an item. Mm. Those things are rather small and contained uh, uh, and are so varied already uh, that um, you can find a lot of examples of, of what's already been done uh, to inform uh, to inform your design. Mm. Uh, and you can include those in the game in a myriad of ways. Uh, once you start getting like subclasses races backgrounds that stuff can get involved uh but can also be equally uh rewarding uh, yeah I, yeah definitely uh i a friend of mine was playing a paladin uh yuan t uh, uh and he didn't really have an oath that really fit what he wanted to do so he and i sat down and we had we came up with uh with one called uh, the oath of the patient viper it was all about kind of uh waiting and waiting to strike it used poison uh but kind of but like anointed poison 
and uh, it turned out to be really, really cool. But it was also a really in-depth uh, process. You know, mm. a subclass can be like be anywhere between six hundred and twelve hundred words uh, <laughs> if you're following um, uh, a template or uh, you look at the yeah. way it's styled in uh, in the standard reference document or or any of the books. Yeah. Um, and that stuff can require uh, some time and thought investment. Yeah, for sure. I like if I if I were advising someone who was kind of stepping into the world of home brewing, I would agree with you that starting with something like a nightem or a spell would be a good way to, to, to go about it. Also backgrounds, because backgrounds, I feel like have a lot of narrative impact and can accomplish a lot in terms of customizing the session to your campaign world. Um, and they're a way for for players to really sort of express, you know, the the, the exact character that they want to play. Um, when it comes to making like class features and whole classes, the problem with that is that like you have to sort of be willing, or you have to you have to explain and make make it clear that like that's going to have to be an iterate an iterative process. Like yes, um, because. If I make a spell, that's going to get used once or maybe twice a session. Uh, and if it's a little like not tuned very well, that's not a huge impact on the campaign. But if I make a class, that's every minute of that player's e experience in the yes, campaign absolutely. being impacted. And so, like from a one-on-one perspective, um, I would get into those. Getting into those backgrounds is a great way to um to to have a big impact narratively uh but then it kind of gives you a, a bit of i don't know a little bit of like leeway or tolerance with the mechanics absolutely right? actually if you take a look at the player's handbook yeah uh it encourages you it, reading between the lines it encourages you to homebrew your own background uh it uh in the uh in the introduction uh, to the uh, to the chapter, or at least the section on backgrounds, uh, it tells you how to pick a background, uh, uh, or you can create your own uh, following this step-by-step -step process. Uh, uh, you're actually encouraged to come up with something that uh, that makes sense to you and appeals to you, but ne yeah. hasn't necessarily been thought of yet. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's go, to our next, let's go to our next slide then. We can talk a little bit about Homebrewing yeah. for GMs. This is this is the big one. I th think this may be why a lot of folks are here. Uh, uh, GMs kind of like once you start GMing, you really get into homebrewing uh, kind of naturally. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of like a natural evolution. Uh, uh, you start playing D and D. You collect a set of dice. Next thing you know, you got an entire bag of dice, and then a box that looks like a mimic. Uh, same, <laughs> and, like the same trajectory is that you you get an adventure. You start playing it. Next thing you know, you're you're making up your own campaign setting. Yeah. Uh, so really, homebrewing for GMs is everything about D and D. Uh, you, you can create everything, but uh, to differentiate between players, we're talking about uh, NPCs and creatures yeah. and monsters. Mm -hmm. uh, their actions, their traits, uh, uh, their lore, uh, world building, which is an, a, a massive topic entirely on its own, um, and maybe a, a scope that we can uh, get into in a future uh, 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 seminar. Yeah. Um, adventure paths, uh, which can be as detailed as, as fully uh, uh, crafting and, and statting and um, uh, supplying an adventure uh, with uh, with every little item in every little room, or it can be as broad as just like uh, a few thought bubbles with like a, a connection path through them. Yeah. Uh, NPCs, uh, traits, bonds, ideals, goals, characteristics, uh, those things that help create the personality of the NPC. Um, that's all homebrewing. Yeah. If you were sitting and you needed to improvise an NPC in your session, um, what what do you think are the core things that you need to decide like right now on the fly? What do you well, need? 
for well, the for, NPC. Well, for me, uh, I usually yeah, decide on one of the three voices that I can usually do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You now know, you, you, that's like a challenge. Like, to, like, let me hear the voices. No, don't worry. Uh, no, I'm. I'm okay. I'm Go all, ahead. So you've got, we I'm all have like enough. three voices. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, but uh, take a look at some traits, ideal bonds, flaws, goals, <laughs> characteristics that are already out there. Uh, you look at the stuff that already kind of defines personality. Uh, yeah. Then you look at how, at what that NPC is doing in the adventure. Yeah. And you think about, you try to put yourself in their shoes. Uh, think about what they want, what they need, uh, and where they come from. You know, culture might be uh their own background uh and you kind of build on that um usually when you're doing that uh i recommend just start with like one or two points um mm -hmm. especially if it's an npc that your players may only meet once and if they only meet once and they come back and they really love right. that npc and they want to right. meet them again right then that's your in to like develop them more you yeah. know that you know that the hook's been uh bit on and uh, uh yeah. you can really flesh out that fish yeah i think i'm often like if i'm in a session and i have to make somebody up uh, I find that a, a good NPC needs a solid three things. They need a name, they need a fit or an outfit, and they need something that they really want. And if you've got those three things, you've got a pretty, you've got a solid start to a good NPC. I oh, think. absolutely. If you're, if you're in the session live and just need to make something, name, outfit, and a motivation, something they really want to go after. Could just be like a good tankard of ale. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. But for sure, yeah. Um, do I have anything else I wanted to add to that? That's very, you're so thorough with this. Um, where are we at? Improving supplemental effects. Hmm. Nope, that's it. We're good. I'm good. Cool. We can move on to the next, next slide. slide. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so there's more uh, for GMs because it's the entire game. Uh, mm -hmm. Encounters and uh, game mechanics that um, are new or uh, outside of, of what you're familiar with. Uh, uh, I recently uh, used um, a uh, rock, paper, scissors mechanic that uh, uh, I borrowed from uh, Fire Emblem uh, to help uh, my players manage their allies as they are uh, working their way through uh, this cathedral-like mega dungeon. It's uh, is the penultimate situation uh, for the story arc they're in and uh, their characters need to keep their eye on the ball. There's a lot going on in there. So they have to be able to uh, uh, educate their allies, uh, but rolling out an encounter for each, each allies fight is so much more than my players or I are prepared to do. So yeah. instead we used rock, paper, scissors, and just a few extra uh, fiddly bits uh, to help play with that in a way that uh, feels meaningful, but also doesn't become overly time consuming. Uh, yeah, it's like that fine line between just hand waving something completely mm -hmm. and playing down to like the last hit point or the last social interaction. It's like to have some tools in the toolbox between that for determining outcomes can be really helpful Absolutely. and looking to looking to other systems including um rock paper and scissors it certainly counts that's actually yeah. that's great yeah it's very clever uh, magic items and effects are also pretty important uh you look at um you look at so many of 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 the items out there already and a lot of them really really bend the rules or really D, &D is a game of a game about exceptions the rules mm. state this unless you have this thing that does that mm. uh and magic items sometimes throw that throw that out the window and they're just like you have this this happens <laughs> figure it out yeah yeah um, uh, other game effects uh features like weather traps mounts etc uh, uh mounts are, re are relatively straightforward um really it's uh, the core of it it's it's a move speed uh, with uh, um, uh, a DC for controlling it and that kind of thing. Uh, but it is included there. Uh, weather and traps, I think, are also really important. Um, you can do all kinds of weird weather when magic is involved. Uh, stuff from the elemental planes, uh, uh, stuff uh, caused by chaos, and uh, all kinds of neat things. Uh, traps. Uh, are I think another big one for uh, for GMs. 
um, uh, getting something that isn't just like a pass fail kind of situation, but really has like a multi-step uh, uh, process to it. Hmm. Uh, uh, you know, a trap doesn't just have to be for a rogue. It can be for the entire group. It can be you step on something, you hear it. What do you do? And uh, you kind of like take it from there. Um, but having at least like a framework that you can uh, reference as you're as you're working your way through an encounter like that uh, can be pretty valuable. Yeah, and from a from a homebrew in one hundred and one perspective. So again, someone who's you know started to play and is just getting into the rules and just starting to kind of embark on that you know creativity and that sort of mechanical playing around. I think that. Um, having like like having a little toolkit of fun um effects to add to your encounters is a great place to start like i mean it doesn't sound super exciting but if you can if you've got that in your kit if you have like you know what what happens okay this this encounter or this little little bit is going to happen in, in a really windy environment and how am I going to define that mechanically, not just narratively? Like sometimes it's just good to have it be a narrative, but sometimes you want that to have a mechanical aspect to it. And that's a really gentle way to start as well is absolutely play, play around the fringes. Like you don't have to start by designing a, a whole subclass. You can start by asking the question, how does how is this really strong wind going to affect the the battle? Like what's going to happen with this? And I think that that sort of stuff is a very um, the nice ramp up into some of the more kind of intensive um, intensive things. Yes, absolutely. Um, great. Should we move on? Sure. Okay, let's go to our next slide. Right, homebrewing as improvisation. So the more you understand the basic mechanics of the game, the easier it is to improvise homebrewed content for your session. And I'm thinking of this here as like in the moment, in the moment creation of um, mechanics and element game elements uh, that are being drawn on your knowledge, uh, but not you're not sitting down for an, a couple of hours and really hammering it out. It's all about, um, you know, bringing what you know and playing with it. And um, I, I, I think homebrew, you have the luxury of being messy uh, here in this stuff, right? Like you don't have to dot every I and, and, and cross every T. Like you can decide on what's essential and you can just let the, let the rest ride. And homebrew is a, should be seen as, can be seen rather as an opportunity to, to really play and to play with your improvisation. Um, what yeah. else did I want to say about that? Like, for example, okay, um, you can give yourself a goal as the GM. Uh, tonight, I'm going to fart around with fire, fire effects. I'm going to introduce this somehow. And you can, um, you know, take a few minutes before the session and just bring in what you know of how does how do the rules generally deal with fire or fiery effects and then play with it during the session um like uh, sebastian was talking about that that danger room mentality like um play with it and see what happens um so study a little and then play and then refine and you'll find that your ability to improvise really grows the more you work those muscles and the the more you um you, you do that process that like study and play and revise like that is a really um i don't know it makes you it makes you a better gm too in my opinion but also it's like it 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 i don't know it makes the sessions really um uh sometimes i think as gms uh, sessions can be kind of about making fun for others but this is an opportunity for you as the jam to play yourself and to fart around a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, yeah. what do you think uh, is the most basic mechanic of, of the game? Uh, well, I edition, think, if not D and D. I think, I think that the D 20, I, I'm going to, I would go all the way back to that. You know, it's like they've got, so you've got your die, you've got that one dice mm -hmm. and you've got, um 
that there's a little table for difficulty checks, right? The difficulty value of different actions. Yes. Um, right. Easy is five, average is 10, hard is 15, epic is 20 and up. And I think that um, at the core, I think there's a lot that can be done with just that interaction. Absolutely. I, I agree. Know, that, that would be where I would go immediately. Yeah. What about what you? I love, well, uh, I think what's most intrinsic to 5th edition is probably the advantage-disadvantage mechanic. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Uh, it, in that it Great. essentially gives you uh, a plus four or a minus four to right. your role. Uh, right. Uh, based on the math, uh, but it, it's so versatile. You, you can looking at any situation uh, that your players may have in the game, and you're able to look uh, at what factors uh, into it to uh, mm-hmm. give give or take advantage disadvantage. Um, I think that really is meaningful, and using yes. that. Um, We'll, we'll get you really far if you're just kind of like homebrewing a quick effect or something uh, uh, for your game in the evening. Yeah, that's great. That's exactly right. I think we both answered a single die as our or a, a die roll as our like essentially yeah. essential component. That's very good. Um, I do just want to reiterate, like when you're homebrewing stuff, you don't like you can get messy, leave it messy and figure out what's essential to you at that moment and then move on. And let's move on. To our next slide. Great. I like home this. Do's and home, home do's and home do's. I have a home do right now. Look at that home do shaved. Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> uh, so, uh, some home do's. Uh, do compare your homebrew to similar content. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, stuff that's written. It um, Most of it works. Uh, uh, it's uh, a lot has been uh, tested, uh, play tested, and uh, continues to be play tested as it's played with. Uh, and you know, there's some stuff that maybe doesn't drive with everyone, uh, but uh, you can look at it as a strong framework uh, to inform your own design. Mm. Uh, treat it like a template. Yeah, definitely. Um... Let's go to the next slide because I think there's a few things to say about our home do- or our home don'ts. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, you, I think the most important one is don't rob your players of their agency. They're playing the game. They're playing the game with you, and you're playing the game with them. Everyone's a player at the table, including the DM. Uh, but what you don't want to do is take away from them the ability for them to make their own decisions. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, especially when uh, when they're acting uh, as a uh, as a character that they've put a lot of thought into, uh, uh, the last thing you want to do is uh, uh, put them in an imaginary bag, holding, and uh, prevent them from uh, popping out and being able to do and uh, mm. uh, achieve uh, their their character's goals. Um, you also don't want to get lost in the trees, uh, or uh, sorry, get lost in the forest counting all the trees. Uh, uh, you don't want to get so distracted by all the details that um, you miss out on the fun of playing the game. Yeah. If if you're there, if you're only there for like three or four hours, and uh, mm-hmm. there is a rule that you're foggy about, and you get into all the books and you get into an argument, next thing you know, you've lost a a good chunk of the time that you've you've set aside to play with with your players, with your friends. Uh, and you spend it on something that you could have just agreed on a decision for and then move forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, don't forget that this is a game. Uh, it's meant to have fun. Uh, a lot of homebrewing can be really fun, especially when you're collaborating together. Uh, you should keep that in mind as you go forward. Uh, my last uh, note here is you <laughs> don't want to just use D&D uh, wiki.com as your only source of homebrew con- comparison. Um, you can start there. Uh, it's kind of kind of treat it like uh, uh, Wikipedia, uh, in that it may be a starting point for you, a reference point. Uh, but you should look at uh, other sources as well. Um, uh, some of the content on there can be uh, a little unfair, uh, or uh, um, uh, hmm. ill thought. Hmm. 
I really I want to pick up on this idea of yours of not getting lost in the forest counting the trees when you're home growing I think especially when you're first starting to kind of make your own rules your own house rules your reskins those sorts of things when you're doing that home brewing action um, I think you can get you can be drawn into the lure of the complexities of the mechanics of the things and um, you can end up creating things that are on paper really fascinating and then in play are just a huge pain in the ass and so i think it's good to uh be kind to yourself and kind to your players in what you create not like i mean you know be nice to your players all the time but i mean be nice to yourself and your players like let's not add too many new things to track or too many, like try to keep it simple, maybe add one or two elements rather than, you know, lobbing a bunch of stuff on there. Right. Think, or uh, don't worry too much about uh, the implication of the physics that your magic <laughs> spell or item might cause. Uh, uh, just trust each other, have fun. Don't worry if it's t uh, turtles all the way down. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's good. All right, well, let's move on to our next slide. Um, so I guess I wanted to take a little bit of an opportunity to just give some, um, some tips for quickly kind of coming up with some of these uh, mechanical elements, or even if you're just sitting down for the first time to make your first magic item for D&D. For that uh, that there's some some things are very impactful on the power level of that uh, of that particular element, and so I wanted to I just wanted to bring that to some folks to, to everyone's attention. So, for example, with magic items, um, remember that attunement is a real thing. Why? Um, because you've got three slots, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that you for for attunement, and there's in the rule set, like there's a bunch of items that are um, that don't require attunement, and then there are some items that do require attunement. And if you if you sort of like open, I mean, of course you can open the door and do whatever you want, but remember that when you're when you're making an item, consider is this item of the of a power range that uh, that should require commitment, the kind of commitment that attunement um makes or not so so consider that and remember that that's that's quite impactful and so look in the examples of of the items that are there for things that are are attuned and not attuned because it gives you a good sense of that a little bit um go ahead uh looking behind uh, looking behind attunement and why it's a thing i think it's because if, if you look at so many of the items that require attunement, uh, that's a paragraph worth of of a new rule that mm. you often have to you have to learn, mm. and you intend to use. And if you look at any character's suite of abilities, uh, traits, and actions, there is a lot that can be done. Uh, uh, a lot that you at some point you're never going to run out of stuff. Uh, by limiting attunement to three things, I think the intent was it's a little bit of a speed bump in that uh, it gives you a limit of things that you're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. So you are not spent the entire, you're not getting lost in your character sheet and you, you're you playing with a smaller uh, scope of things, mm -hmm. uh, but you're actually getting to play with them. Yeah. And and you're making choices. You're making mm -hmm. interesting choices too, right? Yeah, um, choices when you're are, making, are meaningful to the narrative. When you're making magic items, also consider the rarity of items. And I am such a huge fan of minor magic items. I can't remember where those got introduced. Maybe it was Xanathar's or something where they started introducing yeah. the concept of minor, which don't have a big mechanical impact, but have this like narrative flair to them. There's so much fun to be had there. Um, all the way up to legendary items, but do consider the power level and rarity when you're making magic items and, you know, check into, oh, like, it, you know, is my third level party getting a hold of this thing a little, a little too early or not, or, um, and then again, I know I sort of said this before, but try to avoid really bloaty mechanical trackery things. For example, a sword, 
that will unlock a new set of abilities once it's been a part of um, 20 battles against uh, goblins. Um, sounds super exciting, but also someone has to track that. Like yeah. either the player does or you do. And then you're like, oh no, didn't we fight goblins that one other time? It's like, be nice to yourself when you're home brewing things. Is, you is... also as the DM have to have to give them 20 goblin encounters. Then. <laughs> right, you've, exactly. you've, by, by creating something like that, you have committed yeah. yourself yeah. to 20 goblin that's encounters. Right. And I that's love right. goblin encounters. Sure, but at sure, some point sure. I want to fight kobolds. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. So again, avoid the bloaty mechanical things. Consider the rarity and remember attunement is real. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Well, I was going to ask oh, you, John, ahead, do yeah. you do you have a, um, a personal favorite uh, magic item that you move homebrewed for your players? That I've homebrewed for my players? Um, yeah. I have homebrewed so many things, um, uh, both successfully and unsuccessfully. Ooh, I want to uh, hear an unsuccessful one. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, my goodness. Um, hmm, that is a rough question. I uh, don't have an easy answer to that. I'm trying to think of a an item. Oh, oh. Hmm. I did, we did work with, um, like in the current campaign, we're working with this concept of like, um, sort of uh, character defining archetypal magic items. Mm -hmm. So like the character will kind of, after a few sessions, um, you will begin to think about an item that will help to define that character both in terms of its mechanics in the session, but also just like its place in the narr in the world in the story sure. world, and um, and those are always really fun to come up with. They're often reskins of uh, existing items. So like we'll take a crystal ball and then we'll reskin it as you know something else, a pendant, um, and then add a few sort of little bits of narrative uh, uh, some narrative elements onto it. Um, I'm a big proponent of stealing. Uh, characteristics and and things directly from other items and just kind of lumping them together. Yeah, I um, love reskinning things. I, I, yeah, that's a, I'm a big fan of doing that because then sometimes the players don't even know what what they have and they're like, mm -hmm. "Wow, you're really creative, John. You've really, <laughs> you've really gone above and beyond." And it's like this is just like a crystal ball that I stole. Anyway, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's move on to the next yes. slide. Okay. Subclasses. Um, I I put a big like if you must on my notes for this slide. I clearly I'm like dubious about my own ability. Maybe I'm not sure. Um, I think that uh, there are so many classes and subclasses um, out there, literally dozens. And if you are having a hard time finding something that your players and you can use, um, clearly it's time to get home brewing. Um, Man, this is such a commitment, you know, to multi multiple sessions, and it has a huge impact on a player's experience. So just be ready to deal with that, I guess. Yeah. Um, remember that, I guess, really important is that class features arrive at specific levels, um, depending on the type of class that they are, and pay attention to that. Go and look at some other... Um, some other archetypes for your subclasses that are similar and follow that guideline. Like um, there's a, you know, there are, there are kind of tiers of play, right? Like there is a tier system of play and you don't want to, if you're, if you just, you want to be aware of that, I guess. Yeah. And then also class resources when you're designing uh, your features, like channel divinity, superiority die, that sort of thing. Um, that's a really fun thing to play with. Uh, but uh, um, there's a lot to be learned about how to limit or how to kind of balance out a class's power by looking at, okay, how many times can it do this? You know, Absolutely. how many times, what are the resources that are required here? Um, anyway, that is, that was my, my thoughts on um, subclasses. Uh, I think we should move on to our next slide just to yes. make sure that we sort of get through the bulk of our content here. Great spells. I love homebrewing spells. Um, I think that they are a great place to start as well if you're just kind of looking into getting into homebrewing because um, they're going to be used once or twice a session maybe and I think they're a great place to start. I think it's yeah. really important that 
I think you you, you will do yourself a, 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 a favor by going and reading the, making sure that you understand the types of spells, the schools of magic. Um, and because they, they tie together the spells um, in a really nice kind of narrative way. And I think that you can really, uh, having an understanding of that will help you to homebrew good spells, I think. Um, also keep in mind action economy. Um, unless it's really important, a spell should take an action to cast. There's, there's, there's like, there are exceptions, of course, but uh, in general, spells are impactful and in general, they take an action to cast. Sometimes they don't. And if they don't, if you're going to make a thing like, oh, it's a reaction or, oh, it's a bonus action, uh, be really mindful of that, of that action economy. How is that really going to impact the, 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 um, the round to round sort of experience there. Yeah. Magic um, has a cost. Uh, yes. And right. uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, it's the Vancean magic system uh, based on the Dying Earth novels by Jack Vance. It's the idea that uh, you've memorized a spell uh, and you have a certain amount of energy uh, spell slots that you can use to cast that spell. And then you have those actions in turn, depending on how, how much time it takes to to create that uh and that's that's part of our that's part of D and it's important when designing a spell you keep uh that in mind and if you're making spells um read about the the material somatic and verbal components because the system as it's designed right now is done pretty purposefully uh, around those components. And I know that it's very, I know that oftentimes it's very hand, we get, we get a bit hand wavy with components, but it is impactful um, how often you get to cast the spell, that sort of thing, it, that's impactful. So consider those things as well. Yeah, especially when you have other uh, spells and effects in the game that target those, uh, yeah, i.e. Right. the silence spell, uh, right. making it, impossible to use verbal components in the area yeah uh, yeah or rich or some ritual spells that you know have a lot of cost associated with them in terms of money absolutely. like yeah okay let's move on to our next slide okay so we had we just came out of a nice big great seminar on making monsters so i don't want to spend a lot of time but here's some practical tips if you're starting out with home brewing here are some very practical points. Um, a very fast way to make a monster harder is to give it a legendary resistance. Give it one, two, three charges of that, of uses of that ability. These big firm nopes, uh, they are, they're, they're, they're deadly. <laughs> they're super yeah. deadly. They seem really small, but a holy smack. Be careful though, because oftentimes uh, oftentimes you're going to use those saving throw, those big firm nopes, you're going to use them against the, uh, the spell casters of your party. And they're going to start to feel really sad uh, over time. Like, oh, the, you know, so be, be judicious, but um, legendary resistances have a lot of impact on a monster. So be careful when you're giving them uh, and just know that when you do, you're, you're really providing quite a bonus to that monster. Absolutely. Uh, saving throw bonuses are huge, um, as are damage resistances, and they're a way that are, it's kind of, you can very easily accidentally make them too powerful. Saving throw bonuses have a huge impact. Like, if you have a monster that ha that's, like, proficient in dexterity saves, oof, that really negates a lot of business, right? So well, be careful with that. Like, watch out for that sort of thing because it stacks onto the challenge rating of monsters pretty quickly when they start getting those saving throw bonuses. Uh, and this is my personal big bugaboo here is um, adding conditions like stunned or paralyzed to the actions of a monster uh, can very quickly overpower monsters and they just suck the fun right out of the fight. Right, we're talking about player agency there. Uh, we really are, and yeah. and that for me, when I'm home brewing, I'm even you know even when I'm playing monsters from official sources that have those effects, whew, I'm so careful about that because imagine you're a player, 
who gets to play for four hours every other week and it's it's the big fight and you've been working up to it for like two months and it's the here you are you're at that big moment and then in that encounter you're stunned for like half of it and you don't get to do anything that's gonna break my heart as a player and it should break your heart as a gm too if you have a heart you should yeah it should break your heart as well so be that's careful 100 my that's why my favorite uh condition is the poison condition because it doesn't mean you can't do anything it just means you do things badly yeah. and uh doing things badly is a great narrative prompt um, you should you should really absolutely and you should really consider uh, um, conditions like stunned and paralyzed and stuff you should consider those to be like that monster just got to attack for three times the damage that it did because it, right. it's taking a whole player out of the equation so mm -hmm. be, be judicious about that also go and watch the monster building um seminar that that was just previous to this one um because it's great and has lots of really good tips for making monsters but there's some three very very practical tips with with uh, building monsters i thought i'd throw out there excellent um okay let's go to our next slide some concluding thoughts um okay so here we are uh homebrewing is simple uh improv it but is. it can also be what uh, collaborative projects, uh, working together uh, to uh, make your dreams come true. Your imagination uh, <laughs> is the limit. Uh, and uh, when you got uh, yourself and several other players, you've got four or five different imaginations. You can come up with some crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's obviously, it's also a really great way to em embrace your own um, creativity and for you to play as a um a, i don't know to, yeah to embrace your creativity and play you know get that sense of play in there is important and uh it keeps you sharp uh, uh mm. test your knowledge of mechanics uh it helps you develop that system mastery that uh people throw around and uh, uh really gets you familiar with the game uh, which sure makes you want to play more of the game uh and uh, uh it creates a feedback loop of, of gaming now we had had a, a, a plan to maybe do a, a little uh, a little sort of fun exercise here, but we're very close to being out of time, Sebastian. So yes. I think we'll just throw it open to a couple of questions, I guess, before we wrap it up um, today. If there are any questions in the um, chat that are um, needing answering. I had just just a few moments ago i had a fun idea for go. uh for like a special action for a monster okay go. that uh it doesn't target hit points uh the action doesn't reduce hit points or creates a condition instead yep. uh the a player who fails against it uh forget temporarily forgets one action whether they forget how to cast a spell or they forget how to take the attack action so oh, that's funny. that so then they're left to do one of the other actions like using an object or dash dodge disengage or helping oh another or help like, yes is that i know that's like one of the things help help is one of those things that i am trying to constantly encourage my player to do and they're, they're finally doing it now and they're mm -hmm. just absolutely dominating especially outside of combat can be very very helpful but like even you know Guidance. in a fight or something that ability to help each other uh, yeah i like that a lot that's a lot of fun that's yeah, really i'm great. writing that down for later <laughs> okay um i think that uh um, another thing that can be kind of fun is if you have a um, if you have a monster that you need to customize or you need to um, uh, sort of make more flavorful. I think having you know bring bring with you in a little notebook or on your phone or you know have a document open or something um, of having some very simple uh, traits that a creature can have. Uh, that make it unique and make it flavorful and make it custom. Um, and and you can kind of pull those in like uh, like uh, like flavors and just sprinkle them here and there. Um, you know, in order to make monsters, for example, you know, more or less challenging, you can adjust armor classes, you can adjust hit points, that sort of thing. But you can also uh, you can also bring in cool traits like this monster is on fire. This monster is surrounded by, 
you know, bees, this monster, like you can have kind of those, those, a little, a little toolkit and just make a list of cool things with a very small, quick mechanical effect um, and have that at the ready. And that can also make things really. Um, that really evokes well. Diablo for me. That, like yeah, you have right. normal monsters, but then you yeah. also have like oozing monsters or right. electrified yeah. monsters. Yeah. Affixes, right? Those sort yeah. of affixes. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. Well, I guess um, we will uh, we will close it up there. Um, we did have that slide for our resources that we were going to suggest. Did we want to talk about that at all? Maybe if we could, can we bring up that resources slide just before we, we shut down? That's sure. awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, you should absolutely yeah. get your hands on the Kobold Guides. Uh, mm -hmm. Monsters, game design, world building, magic, uh, um, uh, I think encounters. Uh, go to koboldpress.com um, uh, directly and you can get them there. Uh, oh. Uh, those are really great we, uh, reads, a uh, bunch of essay, essays uh, from um, uh, uh, industry leaders about uh, uh, how to do the things and what to think about when you're making the things. Mm -hmm. uh, homebrewery.com is a fun place uh, if you don't mind doing uh, the, the HTML involved or the, um, you know, whatever the script language is for it. Um, yeah, it's uh, pretty might be basic. markup, I think. Yeah, yeah uh, it's pretty basic markup stuff. But yeah. uh, what's fun about it is it helps you achieve that polish and make your homebrew content actually look like something uh, 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 created for D and D. Uh, it has that has that style, has that look, and it really adds a little bit of uh, validity to it, which is nice. Yeah. Um, I also use Donjon a lot. Uh, uh, fantasy name generators i i have opened my entire game session every game session i have that open up in a separate oh, yeah. window um, yeah big and, ups to fantasy yes. name generators like mm -hmm. how, how often do i use that every session easily? yes and then uh uh <laughs> definitely reference the fifth edition uh uh srd standard reference document uh it's what we uh it's what third party uh creators build everything upon yeah uh, uh it's there for everyone to use Awesome. Well, thanks, Sebastian. Thank I think you, John. Probably we're going to conclude it there. So thanks, everybody, for joining us in this uh, seminar on Homebrewing 101. Um, I've had a lot of fun, and uh, we'll see you next time. Me too. Sounds great. Bye, everyone. Ciao.